And instead of speaking to the rock like he was told to, he spoke to the people. He abused his authority. It happens all the time. Who, who loves Moses? Let me see your hands. If you, if you love Moses, a great person in the Bible, man, some of you, man, you're going to be in for it when you meet him in heaven. We all love Moses. He's a great man. He did great things. He messed up, sure, just like everyone else. But he also abused his authority. He abused his leadership. But we still love him. Yet when someone here on earth abuses their authority, abuses their leadership, oh, false preacher. Oh, he's a heretic. Oh, he's not really saved. And we, we stone him. We were like the people of Israel. Moses said, God, what am I going to do with these people? They're getting ready to stone me. It's exactly how we act when we start persecuting people for missing the mark. Mm. It's getting quiet in here. And it was already quiet in here, so it's getting even quieter in here. Jeez. You see, if, if you read it in Psalms, the Bible says, I think it's in one, Psalm 112, it says that Moses was provoked to speak to the people angrily like he did. Because the people provoked him. They, they just kept pushing him and pushing him and complaining. How many of you know it's, it's hard being friends with complainers? Yeah. It's hard being friends with people who just murmur and complain. There's nothing ever good going about them. You ask them how they're doing and you're sorry that you asked. It, it's just not a good time. And there's millions of them that Moses is in charge of. And he's just hearing them complain and complain and complain to the point where he's like, you know what? What am I supposed to do with you rebels? And he's mad at them. He's frustrated at them. And he lashes out at them. The Bible says he was provoked. But just because you're provoked into being angry, it doesn't give you the excuse to be angry at the people. You're still responsible for your actions, even if you're provoked. Oh, he made me do it. You liar. No one made you do anything. You did it. People say that all the time. Oh, he made me do this. Oh, he made me act that way. Oh, I just couldn't help it because he did this to me. It doesn't matter who did what to who. All of us are responsible for our own actions. Moses is responsible for his own actions. So just to recap, the first thing, the rock, the first rock he encountered, God said, strike it, and he struck it. Water came out. Life came out. The second time, God said, speak to it. Instead, he speaks to the people out of frustration, out of rebellion, out of anger, and he strikes the rock not once, but twice. I, I think it's because the first time he hit it, nothing happened. And so he struck it again out of frustration. Open up in Jesus' name. And he got mad. And this is the, the water came out, the rock split, the water came out abundantly. See, a lot of people don't care how you get the results, or they don't care how you get uh, uh, the, the, the ends that justifies the means to them. It doesn't matter what we do as long as we get these results. It doesn't matter how we go about doing this. As long as I see this happen, we're good. But in God's eyes, it doesn't even matter what the end result is. It matters how you do it. Yeah. Amen. It matters each step. If you do each step exactly how God told you to do it, and you still don't get results, he's more pleased with how you did it than what you got out of it. Amen? Amen. So we can't just do things for the sake of the end. We can't just do things for the sake of the result. And all the things that we did uh, caused hardship and troubles and pains and remorse and regrets. The Bible says the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. There's a lot of rich people right now that they have a lot of money. They, they got their end result, but the journey that they took to get the end result hurt a lot of people, hurt a lot of businesses, hurt themselves. Mm. We have to be sensitive to listen to how God wants us to do things. So if you are writing notes today, the title of today's message is Quit Striking the Rock. Quit Striking the Rock. See, provision of the Lord is a process. 
There was a process to receive God's provision. God set this up in, in a very strategic pattern, a strategic way to do things. And the first step, if you're writing this down, if the first step of receiving God's provision is the rock must be struck, that's the first step that has to happen. The rock must be struck. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. Who is this talking about? The Israelites. They were under the cloud. God followed them as a cloud by day and a fire by night, and they passed through the sea. Verse 2, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 3, all ate the same spiritual food. This is talking about the manna that fell from heaven. Verse 4, all drank from the same spiritual drink, the water from the rock. Verse, uh, continuing verse 4, for they drank of that spiritual rock and followed them. And that rock was Christ. Some people have, have taken this out of context and saying that the rock was like, was literally Christ. But it's a spiritual example. If you just go a couple of verses down, Paul says, all this is for your example. It's a metaphor. It's an illustration. It's a symbol. It's not literal, it's a symbol. And the rock symbolized Christ. God told Moses, strike the rock and I will stand on it. Symbolically. And Moses struck the rock and what happened? Water gushed out. Life poured out from the rock. It was a spiritual metaphor for the rock of our salvation, which is Jesus. See, Christ he had to be struck to appropriate, to get into motion his provision. Without Jesus being struck, there is no way for his provision to get to us. No way. Provision spiritually, physically, financially, emotionally, nothing that we can receive right now could have happened if Christ was never struck. It couldn't have happened. So the first step, Jesus had to be struck. With Moses, God said to strike the rock. The rock must be struck. And when it was struck, water came out. Life came out. The second step is that the rock then must be confessed. The rock must be confessed. In Romans 10, 5, the Bible says, for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. I've never said that in my life, Matthew. I've never said this. I've never said that. But you know what this is telling us that we have said? It's saying, who shall ascend into heaven? Who shall go up into heaven and intercede on our behalf, if not Christ? Us. That's saying, it, that's saying I will be good enough. I will be holy enough. We've all said it. Aren't I good enough, God? How come you're not blessing me, Lord? And then it says, who shall descend into the deep, into the abyss, saying that if you sin, you got to bear the punishment. If you mess up, the condemnation's all over you. If you mess up, you're cursed with the curse. That's saying the same thing. In other words, what this is saying is that the righteousness of faith does not say, I am saved and blessed in my own ability. That's not what it says. But what does it say? Verse 8. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess, someone say confess. Yes. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Right. And so it 
The first part of it was that the rock had to be struck. That Jesus was a symbolic rock. But the second part is that the rock must be confessed. In order for us to receive what God's done for us, it does not take performance. It does not take anything that we do on our own ability. It doesn't take any dead works. It takes confession and believing that he did it. Amen? Amen. Mm. Those who still believe in their performance, that their performance is essential for their salvation, are denying that Christ is even in heaven, making intercession for man. People who say that if I'm just good enough, if I'm good enough, I'll get to heaven. What they're saying is Christ is not on the throne. Christ is not up in heaven interceding on our behalf and that they are good enough to get to heaven. Not by works, It's not by performance. It is not by anything we do. You see, we don't have to ascend into heaven or go to the depths of hell to get our needs met. We don't have to be good enough or be bad enough for God to do anything to us. All we have to do is confess, to believe in our heart and to confess with our mouth. My boy just clapped right now. <laughs> yeah, preach it, Daddy. Yeah, Bubba. It's not by our own efforts. It's not. And people who say that it is are the ones that are saying, who will ascend into heaven and who will descend into the deep? It's nothing that we can do on our own that can get us any of God's provision. It is all on what he did. Now, how is this equivalent to Moses? See, striking the rock is equivalent to us doing things on our own ability. God first told him to strike the rock, and then he told him to speak to the rock. But Moses, instead of listening, he said, because you did not believe, because you didn't believe, you will not enter the promised land. See, when Moses struck that rock the first time, nothing came out. And then he hit it again out of frustration. See, God's trying to get things to you all the time, but you're too busy striking that dang rock. Christ is trying to bless you. Christ is trying to heal you. Christ is trying to provide for you. But you are so busy striking that rock because it's not breaking. It's not working. You keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. Eventually, you might get something, but all the effort that you went through, it's not worth it. All the pain that you had to endure, it wasn't worth it. All the hardship you had to face, it wasn't worth it. The woman who had the issue of blood, the Bible says that she spent all her money, all of her resources on doctors and medicine, trying to get healed. But she got no results. She's striking the rock. She's hitting that rock. See, Moses, he got it to open, but it would have saved him a lot more time and a lot more energy and a lot less frustration if he would have just listened to God the first time. If he would have just spoken to the rock when God said to speak to the rock, he wouldn't have had to strike it. He wouldn't have had to use energy. He wouldn't have had to exert himself. All he had to do was speak to it. God's telling us every day, speak to that rock, but we're all, busy, we're all too busy striking it. God, I've gone to church. God, I'm reading my Bible. God, I've given to you. God, I I bless people. God, I prayed for this person. God, I'm always doing good things. God, I didn't sin today. God, I'm doing good enough things. Why am I not receiving your provision? You struck the rock. Every time we approach God based on our ability, we strike the rock. And here's why that will never, ever work. We've been striking the rock, but the rock can only be struck once. The rock can only be struck 
one time. And when did that happen? On the cross. In Romans chapter 6, verse 5, I'm just going to spit all these out to you, and you can go dissect them later. Romans 6, 5 through 10. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that there should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Hebrews chapter 7 in the New Living Translation. He is the kind of high priest that we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners, has been given the highest place of, of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. The, they did this for their own sins first than the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins hebrews 9 11 through 12 so christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come he has entered that greater more perfect tabernacle like mary was saying earlier which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world with his own blood not of the blood of, of goats and calves he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever Amen. hebrews 9 28 so also christ was offered once for all time yes. as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people he will come again not to deal with our sins but to bring us salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him hebrews 10 10 through 14 for god's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priests stand and minister before the altars day after day, offering the same sacrifice again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as the single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Ban, if you can join me this morning. One time, one sacrifice, one offering. You cannot strike the rock anymore, church. Every time you strike the rock, it is made in vain. Every time you hit that rock, you're putting Christ to shame. Every time we try to go before God in our own ability, in our own efforts, we are putting the cross of Jesus Christ to shame. And we're trying to strike a rock that's already been struck. The way we receive provision in our life is not by striking that rock anymore it's not by it's not by doing works it's not by being good enough in our efforts it's not about performance it's about putting faith in him and confessing what he's done amen thank you lord let's play something come on see this is why moses had to strike it twice the second time before water came out it was more work. It was more effort. If you think that good enough deeds are, are enough to get Christ's provision in your life, you're going to have to keep working. You're going to have to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it until you get, you get to a point where you can't do it no more. Thank you. In Mark eleven twenty three. 23. The scripture says, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed 
and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. I want to read this out of the, the name. Uh, this is the weirdest translation I've ever read before. It's called the Names of God translation. I, I just stumbled on it, but I like what it said. It says, I can guarantee this truth. This is Jesus talking. I can guarantee this truth. If Jesus guarantees you something, you better believe it's true. I can guarantee this truth. This is what will be done for someone who doesn't doubt but believes what he says will happen. He can say to the mountain, be uprooted and be thrown into the sea, and it will be done for him. See, this, this, this isn't something that people made up. This isn't something that people are just, are just doing because some guy said to do it. This is a principle that started way before even Jesus walked on the earth. She's the answer to your problem, church. It's not by striking the rock. It's by what you're saying. The answer to your problem is found in what you are saying. If you are speaking death, if you're speaking, speaking words that, that give no life, if you're speaking words that, that don't edify you, if you're speaking words that put you down, you're striking the rock. But when you speak words of life, when you speak words of truth, when you speak words of faith, when you speak words of grace, when you speak His words, when you let His words come out of your mouth, It's as if you speak to that rock and the water comes gushing out. Jesus said many times, says, if you drink from this water, from this well, this natural earthly well, you will thirst again. But if you drink from the water I give him, if you drink from the water that I provide, it'll it'll spring up in you and a, a, a well of water that's overflowing, abundantly overflowing, and you will never thirst again. To receive his provision, we got to stop striking the rock. Stop striking that rock and start speaking to that rock. Amen. The rock symbolized Christ and not just Christ, but Christ's provision. In Psalms, the Bible says this in the Psalm of David, he said, send now prosperity. He's not commanding God to do anything. He's commanding the blessing to work for him. See, we never speak to God to do anything for us, but we speak to what God's given us to appropriate into our life. We speak to what God's already provided in our life to manifest in our physical life. We aren't telling God what to do. We're not telling him how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. We are speaking to the blessing that he already provided to make manifest into our life. If I can just encourage you, if you've been in a place where you're frustrated, this is where Moses was. He struck that rock out of frustration. God, why am I not seeing this? God, I've been going to church. God, I've been giving. God, I've been praying to you. I've been reading my Bible. I've been doing good things. I've been good enough. How come I'm not seeing it? Today's your day to start speaking to it. Today, you drop the rod, step away from the rock, and start speaking to that rock. Amen? Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your provision today and for all the good things you do in our life. And Lord, we recognize the burden that may be on our lives, Father, of of trying to do good things to receive from you. But no, Lord, we we recognize that we receive from you because you're the only one who could do those good things. 
You're the one who did the good things perfectly, Father. You're the one who did everything that we ever could try to do. You did it perfectly, Father. And we rest in you. We speak to your provision. We speak to those rocks, Lord. We speak to our problems. We speak to those mountains, Lord. We don't, we don't speak about them. We don't speak to someone about them, Lord. We speak to them. And we command them to work in our life. We command that water to flow in our life, Lord. The water that springs out abundantly, Lord, to come into our life, to come out of our life, not just affecting us, but affecting everyone who we come in contact with, Lord. We're done striking the rock. We're, do we're done trying to be good enough in our own performance. We aren't performance driven. We aren't performance based. We aren't works driven, but we believe in the finished work of the cross, the perfect performance of the cross, Father. And we thank you for that this morning. Thank you, Lord. God, we, are, we recognize that it is not our power. It is not our own authority. It is what you've given to us. You freely gave it to us through Jesus. You passed it on to us as an inheritance, Lord, and we, re we recognize that today. We accept that today. We won't abuse that today. We won't misuse it but we will use it for your glory. We use it for your church, for your purpose, for your kingdom in Jesus name. Everybody said, amen. amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Who's done striking their rock this morning? Thank you, Lord. There's so many powerful symbols all throughout the scriptures it just takes time for you to see them it takes time to recognize them and to not just recognize them but to actually apply it to your life amen amen, amen. thank you lord i hope you're blessed by that today i hope you got something out of it again if this is your first time we'd love to give you a free gift today if you're watching online for the first time we'd love to give you a free gift as well um, just fill out a digital connect card on our website and we'd love to get that towards you. It's been good. God is so good to us. And we cannot expect to receive provision on our own performance. It's not on what we can do, it's what He has done. Amen? We're done. We're not living a life of doing good to get. That's not us. That's not His children. We don't do good to get good. We believe He is good. And we receive from him. Amen. We would like to express our gratitude to the gospel partners of Matthew Ochoa Ministries and Deep Rooted Church. Your generous donations help us provide free ministry materials to those in need. If you're not a gospel partner yet, please consider becoming one by donating $10 or more. Visit MatthewOchoa.com give to learn more about how you can become a gospel partner today.